So good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to, to deal with some email questions tonight. The first one, uh, I'm, I'm going to start with this one, and I'll, I'll read to you the whole email, and then I'll go back through it line by line, and we can talk about it. So here's where it starts. I heard your message on hell. There is no place that God is going to torment and torture anyone. You keep preaching that, and you will scare millions, torment millions, and please the constituency you already have. Jesus is the Savior of the world, but you are blind and cannot believe the words of Scripture. Rodney is right, and you will not listen or refute. You are a coward. Gives his phone number. Call me coward. You will not call me or Rodney because you are a dishonest religious coward. And then there's a section when you complete the online form that asks anything else you'd like to share. And so he had something he wanted to share. Stop teaching lies about God. So that was the, one of the emails we received. And I thought I would just go through this with you because I think it'd be worthwhile to do that. So let's go line by line. The first line is this. I heard your message on hell. There is no place that God is going to torment and torture anyone. So get Revelation 14, verse 9. Revelation chapter 14, verse 9. And what the, the author of the email here is saying is there is no place that God is going to torment and torture anyone. So let's read Revelation chapter 14 and verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So does the Bible say that people are tormented? That's specifically what it says. They're tormented with fire and brimstone. You've probably heard this. What, what is, is often said, I, I have no way of knowing whether it's true or not, but that burns are the most painful wound that you can have. That's what's often said. They're certainly not pleasant. Well, there's people that are tormented with fire. Verse 11, And the smoke of their torment, that obviously relates to the fire, ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So are people tormented? Yes. How long are they tormented? Forever and ever. Do they ever get a break? No, because they have no rest day nor night. So I, I make the observation that people say, well, there's no torment. A loving God wouldn't do that. You're just ignoring what the words on the page plainly say. It, it, it's more than obvious. So here's the next thing he says. I heard your message on hell. I'm going to reread part of this. I heard your message on hell. There is no place that God is going to torment and torture anyone. You keep preaching that and you will scare millions, torment millions, and please the constituency you already have. So what he's saying there is that when someone teaches on hell, they're doing that to please people. So let me ask you this question. Who do you think is in the man-pleasing business? Someone who preaches there is a literal eternal torment in hell or someone who says universalism? Which one of those people is in the man-pleasing business? Isn't it obvious who is? The universalist 
is in the man-pleasing business. Look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. While you're turning there, I'll just make this point. When someone says that there's a literal torment in hell, they do so on the basis of very clear Bible verses. What do you think is the responsibility of someone that says, well, the Bible doesn't actually teach there's a hell. Everyone is saved. How do you think that is going to turn out at the judgment seat of Christ? When you give people false comfort and you tell them, you don't have to worry about hell. There's no such thing as eternal torment. Everyone is saved. That's about the most wicked thing you can do. I'd rather be an alcoholic than say that. Right? I'd rather be a drug abuser. I, God forbid that I ever say that. You're lying to people and damning them to hell is what you're doing. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So what Scripture specifically tells you is going to happen at the end of the dispensation of grace is what are people going to be like? They're going to have itching ears, and they're going to want you to speak smooth words to them to make them feel good. Now, notice verse 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So people have itching ears, and are those itching ears itching to hear the truth? No, they're itching for falsehood, and so what do they do? They turn away from the truth, and they turn to fables. Universalism is a fable, you realize that. It's just completely and utterly false. People that teach universalism are looking for a scripturally uninformed audience that they can minister to. Because if you simply read the words on the page, would you recognize there's a hell, there's a lake of fire, there is torment, and it lasts forever? Now, this next part was in all caps. So this is important. But you are blind and cannot believe the words of Scripture. So I'm going to read a passage to you, and after I read the passage to you, you tell me who's not believing the words of Scripture. The person that preaches hell or the universalist? So here's the passage. Get Mark chapter 9 and verse 43. Mark chapter 9 verse 43. And we're going to read several verses together. And these are really complicated, complex verses to understand. I, I want you to tell me what they mean. Mark 9, 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Now, I can't figure out what that passage is about. What do you think that passage is about? Hell, hell but I, I thought, what, really? 
It says six times the fire shall never be quenched. Now, you're probably aware of this. What do modern versions do in Mark 9? Do you see where verse 44, 46, and 48 all say the same thing? Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched? What modern versions will do is they will say, that's a copyist error. And so when it says the same thing three times, the copyist made a mistake and copied it too many times. And so they, took, they take out two of them. Have you ever in your life as a child had an adult figure say something to you more than once because they want you to get it, right? Isn't one of the things we do for emphasis to repeat ourselves? So like, for example, you might say to a child, I don't want you to play in the street. And so just to make sure that you understand me, I don't want you to go past the sidewalk. I don't want you to be in the street. You have to stay in the yard. And you might say that more than once because the gravity of not understanding it is so extreme. So you repeat yourself, right? How often should you preach the gospel? Should you preach the gospel once and then say, well, I've met my quota for the year? Or do you preach the gospel more than once because of the importance of it, the gravity, right? Mark 9 could not be more clear. There's a hell. There's a fire that shall not be quenched. Universalism says everyone that's saved. Look at verse 45. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell. Doesn't that suggest that not everyone is saved? By the way, if, if, if this matters to you, those are in the red letters. So who's speaking this? This is Jesus Christ speaking this. Now, I, I believe the whole Bible should be in red letters because I think the entire Bible is the Word of God, so I'm not much into red letters. But you do realize in Mark 9, Jesus Christ is speaking. So Jesus Christ himself believed in hell, six times said the fire shall not be quenched, says the worm dieth not describing the state of the lost man's soul in hell. So, who's not believing the words of Scripture? The person that believes in hell or the universalist? So, here's the next part. Rodney is right, and you will not listen. And then there were some typos. All caps, you are a coward. Then the phone number, so I'm supposed to call him. Call me, coward. You will not call me or Rodney because you are a dishonest religious coward. So if you haven't caught on, I'm a coward. So this is my response to that. What I have found over the years is that people who call names typically don't have a valid point. So you can decide for yourself whether or not you think that's true. But it's just an ad hominem attack. Get with me 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 32. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus... What advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Let's understand what verse 33 is saying. Evil communications corrupt good manners. The issue in verse 32 is whether or not there is a resurrection. So look at verse 32 again. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? In other words, 1 Corinthians 15 is all about the resurrection. Paul's making the point that this life isn't all there is. There is a resurrection and a, ne a next life. When he says, what advantage is it me? Why would I fight with the beasts at Ephesus? What he's saying is, I, I would have to be an idiot to spend my life being persecuted for the gospel if there is no next life. Why would I do that? Then I I'm just suffering for no point. 
Let me read it again just so, so you see it. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Why would I do that? That'd be a waste of time. Notice what he then says. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. What Paul says there is, if there is no resurrection and there is no next life, then you ought to live for this life. And that logically makes sense. If there is no next life, if this is all there is, then have as much fun as you can in this life. But of course, his whole point is, there is a next life. That's what the whole chapter is about. Now, what he says in verse 33 is this, evil communications corrupt good manners. So let me give you this illustration. If I teach people there is no next life, this is all there is, are they going to behave righteously or are they going to live in the flesh? They're going to live in the flesh. I'll give you another example. If I teach people you're not created in the image of God, you're just a bald monkey, right? All you are is you're an ape that now doesn't have enough hair. Isn't there a difference in how you think about yourself? There's a difference whether you think about yourself as I am created in the image of God and I bear the image of my creator, a divine transcendent God. I am fundamentally a spiritual being. That's different from you're just an animal that is one further step along the evolutionary journey. Those different worldviews will produce different behaviors. Evil communications corrupt good manners. If you tell people they're an animal, don't be surprised if they live like an animal, right? So now let me suggest this to you. So what if I tell people there is no judgment seat of Christ and you don't have to give account of yourself to God and you're all saved anyway. Well, how do you think people are going to behave? Are people going to walk in the spirit as a result of that? Or are they going to walk in the flesh? The natural result of that teaching, in other words, the natural result of there is no judgment seat of Christ, you don't give account of yourselves to God, and everyone is saved, is lost people will stay lost, and saved people will live like lost people. Because what you're telling him is it doesn't matter. If there is no judgment seat of Christ, why would a saved person, what's the consequence of you living in sin? There is none. So this teaching is evil communications corrupt good manners. Now, what I'll just say, I'll say this further then. So if that's what you teach people, you're going to corrupt their manners, and they're going to write emails like this. That email is the fruit of evil communications, false teaching, where they write silly stuff like that. Doesn't Matthew 12, 36 say that men shall give account of every idle word? Well, if you're going to give account of every idle word, then you had not to say dumb things. Right? You ought to be very thoughtful and careful about what you say. But if you tell people it doesn't matter, there's no judgment seat of Christ, you don't have to give account, people are going to live like that's true. It's not true. My point is this, doctrine has consequences. It just does. It will affect how you live. This email that, that I received, it's the f natural fruit of a universalist ministry. That's what it is. So let me say this to my email correspondent. Universalism is a false gospel. I say, this, I say all this with sincerity and love. Universalism is a false gospel. There is a hell. It is a place of literal torment. We've looked at some verses that prove that. There's a bunch more. Hell is real. Don't kid yourself. It's real. The good news is this. Although hell is real and the punishment is eternal 
and it is torment on the authority of Revelation 14, you don't have to go there. And you don't have to go there because Christ died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. So in, in, consistent with 2 Corinthians 5, I would say that I, I beseech you to be reconciled to God by believing the gospel that Christ died for your sins. That way you don't have to pay the penalty for your own sins. He paid them for you. So I would, I would encourage you in that regard. Next question. I am having a discussion with someone who believes there were no members of the body of Christ in Rome in the book of Romans. He uses Acts chapter 2, verse 10, and Romans 1, 16 as his defense. Were there members of the body of Christ in Rome? So let's look at Acts chapter 2, verse 10, and Romans 1, 16. We'll look at those two verses. Uh, apparently, those are the two verses that the person was using to argue that there were no members of the body of Christ in Rome. Acts chapter 2, verse 10. Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. Now, by the way, there are no members of the body of Christ in Rome in Acts 2, right? Because there is no body of Christ in Acts 2. So I'm not sure how Acts 2 would prove that at the writing of Romans in Acts 20, that there's no members of the body of Christ in Rome. It can't prove that, right? It, it, it just can't. Look at me at Romans 1.16. Romans chapter 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And to be honest, I don't understand how that would prove that there's no members of the body of Christ in Rome. It doesn't really say that. So let's look at a couple different verses. Look with me at Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren. So when he says brethren, that's who he's addressing there. He's addressing the saints at Rome. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also, the ye, he's obviously referring to the Romans, ye also are become dead to the law by the what? By the body of Christ. Well, if he's saying, brethren, ye, the people I'm talking to, you're dead to the law by the body of Christ, what is he saying? He's, he's clearly saying that they're in the body of Christ. That's the whole point of Romans 7, verse 4, and he uses the word ye. Look also with me at Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, I beseech you, so he's addressing the Romans again, I beseech you, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, so he's still writing to the Romans there when he says you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another." Isn't Paul plainly saying when he says you, you, ye, and then he says we, he's including them in, the, in what he's describing, and he says they're members of the body of Christ. So I would suggest to you in response to the question that Romans 7 verse 4 and Romans 12 clearly demonstrate that there were members of the body of Christ in Rome at the, at the time of the writing of Romans. Next question. How do we reconcile the rapture with the fact that, is a, that it is appointed unto men once to die. So let me say that again. How do we reconcile the rapture 
with the fact that it is appointed unto men once to die. Get with me Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. So the, the emailer here is quoting Hebrews 9, so let's look at it. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Now that is certainly a, a true statement in terms of how things generally operate. But let me ask you this. Can you think of anyone in the Bible who never dies? Any man. Enoch is a great example, right? So Enoch never died. And of course, at the rapture, what's going to happen to members of the body of Christ who are still living? They'll be changed, according to 1 Corinthians 15, but they don't die, right? So there's clearly some examples of folks in Scripture who never die. Now, notice something else about Hebrews 9.27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die. Can you think of any people in the Scripture that die twice? Lazarus is a good one. Who else? Eutychus, right? Remember when Paul is long preaching and then Eutychus falls and he dies and Paul revives him? So Eutychus died twice, right? Because after when he died and Paul revived him, guess what happened some point later? He died again. Same thing with Lazarus. Uh, in Luke 8, Jairus' daughter Jairus' daughter was brought back to life. Well, guess what happened to her? She died again. So when you think about Hebrews 9.27, where it says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, that is a true statement for about 99.99999% of humanity. It is. But there are clearly places where Scripture gives you examples otherwise, right? There are people who die twice, and there are people that never die. So the, the way to reconcile it, I think, is that uh, Hebrews 9.27 is the statement of a general principle, but Scripture carves out certain exceptions, one of which is for saints who are raptured. The next question, what does Luke 10.18 mean? So get with me Luke chapter 10 and verse 18. Luke chapter 10, verse 18. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So what is that a reference to? I personally believe that is a reference to the Lord witnessing the fall of Satan early in creation. So why do I say that? Get with me Ezekiel 28, verse 14. If you were to think of a map of the universe, where is God currently situated? He's in, he's in the third heaven. We know that. But what direction of the compass? North, right? So you would, if you were heading to the third heaven, you would head north to the North Pole, and then you would head north from that, right? And, and that's the direction you would go. Look with me at Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14. Let's start in verse 12, actually, just for a minute. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Verse 13, 
Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. So it seems pretty clear that the king of Tyrus in verse 12 is not a reference to a human king of the city of Tyre. It's a reference to Lucifer, to Satan. Now notice verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. If you think about where God is in the universe, he's in the northernmost part of the universe. Satan was created not as an angel, but as a cherub, and he was a particular cherub. He's the cherub that did what? Covereth, right? So he was actually vertically, he's not, he doesn't exceed God in glory, nothing like that, not even close, not suggesting that. But was he vertically higher in the sense that he was the cherub that covereth? Right? Okay. Now, the Lord says in Luke 10, 18, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So what happened to Satan is he fell from that position that he occupied as the anointed cherub that covereth. Now, by the way, you, you probably know this, lightning is often used as a symbol of Satan. Okay, and so that's, what you see in Luke 10, 18, where I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven, that's often a, uh, a symbol that is used for him. Get with me Revelation chapter 12. And I want you to think with me a little bit about the geography of the universe. So Luke 10, 18, the Lord says, I beheld Satan fall as lightning from heaven. I believe that's a reference to him falling from his position as the anointed cherub that covereth out of the third heaven. Now look with me at Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. This is the middle of the 70th week. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So Luke ten eighteen describes at the beginning of creation Lucifer falls from the anointed chair that covereth. He falls from that position. But at that point, he is still allowed to operate in the second heavens. When you get to Revelation 12, where you're in the midst of the 70th week, what happens? Now, I want to say just something about this because I, I, I just, I love the timing of this. It's exquisite. What God does during the dispensation of grace, he takes 2,000 or so years and he completely forms the body of Christ, right? He gives Paul the, the gospel of the grace of God. Paul goes out and preaches that gospel. Anyone that believes that gospel is placed in the body of Christ. So there's billions of people placed in the body of Christ during the dispensation of grace. At the catching up, every member of the body of Christ is given a spiritual body so they can function in the heavenly places, when that, after that happens, each member of the body of Christ goes through the judgment seat of Christ to determine their reward. When you think about the rewards for the body of Christ, what metaphor, what symbol is often used? Crowns. So it's about positions of authority. So what that means is when the judgment seat of Christ occurs... Every member of the body of Christ has been identified. 
They've all been given spiritual bodies and they've all been given their permanent responsibility in the heaven for all eternity, right? The rapture, think about the chart, the rapture happens right before the, the resumption of the prophetic program and you go into the 70th week and God gives instructions to Michael. This is the part I love. He gives instructions to Michael and says, it's time. W would Michael have been willing to war with Satan a long time ago? Yeah. He is obeying and he's waiting for God to give him direction. And what God does is now that the body of Christ, the successor, the replacement for Satan and his minions is formed, get him out of here. So Satan, in Revelation 12, Satan and his angels, he was in the third heaven, now he's in the second heaven, now he's kicked out from the second heaven all the way down to earth. What happens in warfare when you lose the high ground and you have the lower ground? It's an inferior position. It's a position of, of peril and danger, right? Beautiful verse in, in, in Revelation 12, 12, where he has great wrath. Why? Because he knoweth that he hath but a short time, right? So he's on that earth for a short time, having fallen all the way from the third heaven. We know that he's then going to be locked in the prison, right? The bottomless pit for a thousand years. Then after he gets out of the bottomless pit to lead the rebellion at the end of the millennium, get with me Isaiah 14, verse 9. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 9. Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 9. Hell from beneath is moved for thee. We'll figure out the thee in a minute. For thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. Whoever this thee is, when he arrives in hell, does everyone want to see the kings, the chief, chief ones of the earth? Why do you think the chief ones of the earth want to see this? Doesn't 2 Corinthians 4 tell you that Satan hath blinded the minds of them which believe not? Satan is involved in the deception that causes people to go to hell. Yes? Yes. So might those people in hell take pleasure in seeing him there? That in other words, he has to suffer the fate that they have been deceived into suffering. Yes? Verse 10, all they shall speak and say unto thee. Dude, you've, you've noticed this, right? In human nature, in warfare, in sporting competition, do, do adversaries talk to one another? Do they mock and taunt? And They do, don't they? That's what's going on here in verse 10. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Satan, you were going to accomplish all these things in your rebellion, and you're just a captive here like us. That's what they're saying to him. Verse 11, thy pomp is brought down to the grave. What does the word pomp mean? Whenever uh, I see the word pomp, I think of pomp and circumstance, right? Do, 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 do. You know the words to that? My reindeer is purple. Do, do, you haven't heard that? So, when they say thy pomp is brought down to the grave, what they're saying is all your splendor, all your glory, all that you took pride in, right? We saw earlier, he sealed up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. 
Thy pomp is brought down to the grave. And the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How'd you like that? How'd you like to be surrounded by worms for eternity? Verse 12, how, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? You see the word fall there again. How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. See, he was planning to ascend, but he falls, 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 falls. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. See how all those things are vertical? I will sit also upon the mount of congregation, the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou, be sh yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? So my observation is this, what you see throughout time when you go, begin on the chart and you go to the end, what happens to Satan? He goes from the summit of the universe to the lowest hell. That's what happens to him. What happens to the body of Christ at the catching up? We ascend and our ascension is what leads to his fall, right? Right? Because our ascension is the replacement for him. Michael then kicks him out. People often wonder the question, well, if dispensationalism is true, why wouldn't more people believe dispensationalism? Well, the answer is, you know, first of all, truth is not determined by majority vote, right? So that's just, it's a dumb argument. But, but what's really going on, Satan hates the body of Christ with a passion. The body of Christ is the replacement for him and all of his angels in the heavens. You're going to take his place. So how do you think he feels about that? Well, he hates it. And that's why he wants to blind people as to the gospel of grace so that they don't believe it and be saved. So that was a long explanation about Luke 10 verse 18, but that's how I would suggest you think about it. Next question. In the Lord's Prayer, it says, lead us not into temptation. Does that mean God can lead us into temptation? I thought God never leads us into temptation. So let's get two verses together at the same time. Get James chapter 1, verse 13. James chapter 1 and verse 13 and then the other verse is Genesis 22, verse 1. So James 1, 13, and then Genesis 22, verse 1. I want you to have both of them because we, we need to look at them together to see what's going on here. So let's start in James 1.13. James 1.13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So James 1.13 says God doesn't tempt anyone. Genesis 22, verse 1. Genesis 22, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. So we have a problem, don't we? Genesis 22, verse 1 says that God did tempt Abraham. And James 1, 13 says, Neither tempteth he any man. So is that a contradiction or what is that? So what I'm going to do is, uh, and I'm going to project here, uh, we're going to look here at, uh, so I've pulled up the 1828 dictionary. 
That's a very good point. So let's click off there. Okay, sorry about that. Can everyone see now? So I've gone to the Webster's 1828 dictionary and I'm going to click on the word temptation. And so let's look here. Now the first thing I just want you to notice, you see how there's multiple different senses of the word. There's five different ones. So let's read this here. Temptation. And actually I did temptation. I'm going to do tempt. But we, we could do it similarly, but I'm just going to do tempt because that's what I looked at earlier. So tempt. And again, you see here that there's five different entries. So first definition, to incite or solicit to an evil act, to entice to something wrong by presenting arguments that are plausible or convincing or by the offer of some pleasure or apparent advantage as the inducement. So that usage of tempt, the first one, is to tempt someone to do something bad, right? To tempt them to do something evil. When you think of things like, for example, sexual temptation, it's a temptation to do something evil, okay? Now, go down to section, uh, sense five. In scripture, to try, to prove, to put to trial for proof. And the idea there is to test or to prove something. The sense in number five is not an evil sense. It's simply a testing or a proving. Now, by the way, just notice this. I'm going to go back up to sense number one for a minute. This is one of the fascinating things about the 1828. It will often quote Bible verses in the dictionary entry. So notice with the first entry here, to incite or solicit to an evil act, it quotes James 1.13. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. That's, of course, the verse that says, that says with regard to God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So in other words, just to make clear on this, when you read James 1.13, I'm just going to read the whole verse, you can tell that the temptation being described is a temptation to do evil. So let's read the whole verse and see that. James 1.13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So that temptation there is a temptation to do evil. Well, is God himself ever tempted to do evil? No. Does God ever tempt anyone to do evil? No. So that verse makes perfect sense. God doesn't tempt people to do evil things. Go down to sense number five. In Scripture, to try to prove, to put to trial for proof. In Genesis 22, verse 1, God did tempt Abraham. Did God test Abraham? He did, right? Because what he did is he wanted to see, would Abraham really obey the instruction to sacrifice Isaac? Now, by the way, God was not tempting Abraham to do something evil. He wasn't doing that. He can't do that based upon James 1, verse 13. So what we've noticed is this. The same word tempt is used in Scripture in different senses. We do this all the time in everyday life. The one that always comes to my mind is the word run. So the word run can mean to walk really, really, really fast. Or it can be one point in baseball. Or it can be to execute a computer program. You run a program. Or it's to seek a political office, right? Isn't there a lot of different ways in which the word run is used? There are. And what you have to do is you just have to look at the context to understand which one is meant. If you're watching a baseball game, 
and they're talking about, you know, the home team scored three runs, you know the sense of it is in baseball scoring. And if you're reading something about a political candidate, et cetera, you, you understand that that's how you, you do those things. So with that, let's now go to Matthew 6.13. Matthew 6, 13. And the question was, in the Lord's Prayer, it says, lead us not into temptation. Does that mean God can lead us into temptation? I thought God never leads us into temptation. Well, God never leads us into temptation with evil, right? He never tempts us to do evil. But does God pe lead people into testing? He does. That, that's, that was the experience with Abraham. So look with me at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That verse is not about God tempting man to do evil. Is It is about facing a period of testing. The evil in that verse is in the sense of calamity. So what am I saying? Get Isaiah 45, verse 7. Isaiah chapter 45, and verse 7. Isaiah 45, verse 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. When God says that he creates evil, he's not saying that he sins. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about evil in the sense of calamity, in the sense of destruction. Look with me at Jeremiah 49, verse 32. Jeremiah 49 and verse 32. Jeremiah 49 and 32. And their camels shall be a booty, and the multitude of their cattle a spoil. And I will scatter into all winds them that are in the utmost corners, and I will bring their calamity from all sides thereof, saith the Lord. Are there times in Scripture where God brings judgment, calamity, evil upon people? And the answer is, yes, he does. When the verses talk about God creating evil, it's not sinning. It's in the sense of judgment, calamity. So hopefully that explains what uh, the answer to the question. In the Lord's Prayer, it says, lead us not into temptation. Does that mean God can lead us into temptation? I thought God never leads us into temptation. He never leads people into temptation with evil. Does he lead people into a time of testing? Yes, he does that. Next question. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, is the correct definition for creature the Strong's definition of a man converted from idolatry to Judaism. Okay, so we're going to look at Blue Letter Bible together here. So 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. So you can see the verse there. Let me just show you a, a couple things that are good to know. If I go up to Strong's here and I click on Strong's, it's going to show me the Strong's numbers. Now, why does that matter? The, the, the question here is, is the correct definition for creature the Strong's definition of a man converted from idolatry to Judaism? So what we're going to do here is we're going to find the word creature and we're going to click on the Strong's entry. That's G2937. 
And as we scroll down here, you're going to see, they call it the outline of biblical usage. This is Strong's interpretation or Strong's understanding of how the word creature, uh, G 2937, is used in the scripture. And so you see this one right here, uh, one capital B, little one B, after rabbinical uses by which a man converted from idolatry to Judaism was called. In other words, a proselyte was called a creature according to rabbinical usage, if that is true. Now let me just say something about this. There are some study techniques that are of some use, but are all too often overused. One of them is the use of Strong's. What people do with Strong's is they, just like I showed you, you can go to a particular word, you can click on the Greek or Hebrew entry, and you can pull up Strong's definition of what that word supposedly means in the original language. The first and most basic reason that you really don't need to do that is the King James Bible says in English what the Greek and Hebrew said. So there's relatively little point in doing that. I've, I've showed you how to do this so that you know how to do this, so that you're aware of the technique, but this is something I would not spend a lot of time in because you have the Word of God preserved in the King James Bible, and so I wouldn't fool with this. Now, I will say sometimes it is interesting to uh, see where else the same word is used, and you can do something like that, but I would caution you, I would, I would say it this way. If you're going to the original languages to change the sense of the English, you hadn't ought to do that because the English already reads the way God runs, wants it to read. I'll say one or two things on that before I move on. This is my personal conviction. You can decide for yourself. God promised to preserve his word. How many people on earth today out of the entire population are fluent in biblical Hebrew, biblical Greek, and Chaldean? What do you think, about maybe four or five billion? You're talking about a handful of people. Did God preserve his word in a way where you would have to spend years and years and years of your life to learn the original languages, to read it in the original languages. That, that is not the way God would have preserved his word. What is the most popular language on earth by far? English. Now, the King James Bible was translated in 1611, and the King James became the preeminent translation in the English language at the same time that English became the trade language of the world and England became the empire on which the sun never set. The reason I tell you all that, and you, you can decide whether or not those facts are true, it's, they're rather obvious. What people do today is they say, well, you need to read the Dead Sea Scrolls. They say, well, we discovered Sinaiticus in 1840s and Sinaiticus has the right readings. And if you had modern textual tools, you can get closer to the original. If you say things like that, that we need modern textual tools, or we need the Dead Sea Scrolls discovered in the last 100 years, or we need Sinaiticus discovered in 1840, then what you're saying inevitably is the people before that time didn't have the Word of God. And what you're saying is you're saying you don't believe in preservation. You follow me? In order to believe that the more recent discoveries are significant, then you have to believe that what was before was inadequate. And that in and of itself is an attack on preservation. Let me give you a simple example. Let's say you're a lost man that lived in the 1700s. Wouldn't you like to be able to say at the great white throne judgment, 
God, you can't judge me because your word, you hadn't given us the Dead Sea Scrolls yet. So we didn't really have your word. So you can't hold me accountable of it because I lived at a time when it wasn't available. No man's going to be able to say that because God will say, my word was available to you. You see my point? Okay. Let me give you another study technique that is overused. And that is study Bibles and commentaries. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a Bible study where a verse is being discussed and people will say, well, my footnote says this. And they act like the bottom of the page is the answer key, right? In other words, the top is the text, but the bottom has the answers, and my study Bible says this. Or they will go to a commentary, and so-and-so's commentary says this. Well, it's, it's, it's okay to read those things and, you know, get ideas that people have, but you need to ultimately test them against the Word of God. The study notes and the commentaries are not an answer key, Right? And what happens all too often is people read those and they don't actually prove all things. They just take that as the answer and that's, that's a mistake. So if we're not going to focus on Strong's, we're not going to focus on the original languages, and we're not going to focus on study note, you know, on a, on a study Bible or a commentary's interpretation, how should we go about the answer? So get with me 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. And the question I'm asking is, how would the Holy Ghost teach us to think about these things? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The core principle of Bible study is comparing verse with verse, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. So look with me at 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, and we're going to try to understand what this verse is saying. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature now notice there's a colon there. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. So the first thing you want to do is just to read whatever verse you're looking at multiple times and to read it closely. What I would suggest to you is that the, where it says he is a new creature, colon, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. What the new creature has to do with is old things being passed away and all things becoming new. And the new creature refers to the new things that happen to someone when they are in Christ. Now, the second thing that we want to do, in addition to looking closely at the verse itself, is we want to look at the context. Every verse exists in a context. So let's go up to verse 14 and we'll start there. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Now we notice in verse 15 that there are some folks that were dead, but then they, they live. That's, that's very similar, or I think that's relevant, the, the dead being made to live as the, the new creature that we read about in verse 17. Go down to verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so with regard to the new creature, we've seen a couple things. One is old things are passed away, all things are become new. We also saw that, uh, that folks who were dead are now made to live. And we also saw that we have been made the righteousness of God in Him. Those are all things that are, that are true of the new man. Now, we're not going to do this, 
But I'm, I'm going to leave this, if you will, as to, to sort of uh, further analysis, if you want to take the time to do this. So go back with me to verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So what I would suggest, if, 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 we, if we were going to study this out, the first thing we would do is we would look for verses that have in Christ, that phrase. Because if you are in Christ, you're a new creature. The next search I would run is I would run a search on new creature, you know, open quote, new creature, close quote. And you could also run a search for the word new using uh, just the Pauline epistles. So let me show you just quickly how you would do this. So we're back with Blue Letter Bible. You see how I typed open quote and then in Christ, close quote. So that search will give me every time in Christ appears. We could do the same thing for new creature. And it will pull up those. Now I'm going to show you one more thing that I think is, is useful. So let's say that I'm, I want to... Um, study new creature, but I, w I don't want to confine the search to creature. So I'm just going to run the word new. So I run the word new, but it, it gives me 150 hits, and, and most of these are not Pauline, and the new creature is a Pauline concept. So what do I do? See advanced options here? I'm going to click on this, and, I, and it allowed me to select the range. So I'm going to go in this range here, and I'm going to pick Pauline epistles, and then I just click search, and now I've got all the, the new, every verse where new appears in Paul's epistles. Uh, I just give you that as it's a helpful uh, way to search things. Uh, so you don't want to over-confine your search to make it new, too narrow, but sometimes you do just want to look at where does this appear in Paul, for example, or where does this appear in the Hebrew epistles. That's a technique to do that. Let me show you one more thing. So let's go back to 2 Corinthians 5.17. And I'm going to go to Tools. And you see where it says Cross Refs? I'm going to go over to Cross Refs and click on it. Now what this does, uh, this shows all cross references from the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge. The Treasury of Scripture Knowledge is something done by a man, so it's not infallible, I'm not saying it is. But it often uh, does have interesting cross-references to consider. It, it is something to consider. It's not the final word. Uh, but you see how there's, there's uh, words that are in red. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. This will give you a list of cross-references that, that the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge thinks are relevant to that section of the verse. So I give you that as, as a study tool. And, and I'll just say this. The key to Bible study is continuing to look at verse after verse until you find the verse that explains it. We're supposed to compare spiritual things with spiritual. And so what happens is there's a lot of times you read a verse and you're like, well, I don't know what that means. How are you going to find the answer? Well, the typical way is dig into the Greek or ask someone or you know, find a study Bible. Well, no, the, the, the way to do it is to keep looking at relevant cross-references until you find a verse that explains it. So those are some techniques to do that. We'll do one more question, and that question is this. How to reconcile what Scripture says about signs in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 11, and Matthew 12, verse 39. Are there times when asking for a sign is appropriate? So what the question is asking is what is said in Isaiah 7 and what is said in Matthew 12 about signs is different. How do you reconcile those? So let's start with Isaiah chapter 7 verse 10. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 10. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. 
And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will ye weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now in Isaiah 7, specifically verse 11, God says to ask for a sign, right? Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. And Ahaz says, no, I won't do it. I'm not going to do that. And God says, well, I'm going to give you one anyway. So in Isaiah 7, did God want Ahaz to ask for a sign? And the answer is, obviously, he did. God purposely trained Israel in time past to look for signs. Look with me at Exodus 4, verse 8. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 8. Exodus 4, 8. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. God gave Moses signs for a reason, so that he could demonstrate that he was to be believed. Look with me at Exodus 7, verse 3. Exodus chapter 7 and verse 3. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. When Israel is birthed, if you will, in the land of Egypt, what do they see a lot of? Signs, right? They see a whole bunch of them. So much so that look with me at Psalm 74, verse 9. Psalm 74 and verse 9. Psalm 74, 9. We see not our, O-U-R, signs. Israel had been so trained to look for signs by what God had done with them that they said, we see not our signs. They expected to see signs. So now get with me Matthew 12. So what we've seen so far is God trained Israel to look for signs. In Isaiah 7, God specifically told Ahaz to ask for a sign. Ahaz says, Ahaz says, I don't want one. He says, well, too bad. You're getting one anyway. Because God operated with Israel according to signs. But now look with me at Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Now let me ask you real quick, is that a legitimate request? It is, because God trained them to look for signs. Matthew 12, 39, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. So let's, let's notice something here. What kind of generation was the Lord dealing with? Yeah, evil and adulterous, they're unbelieving. If the Lord had given them a whole bunch of signs, would they have believed? No, because they were an evil and adulterous generation. Now, I want, you to, I want to ask this question. If God trained Israel to look for signs, which he clearly did in the Old Testament, right? Then why would he only give Israel a single sign during his earthly ministry? Because isn't what he says there, there shall no sign be given to it, but... The sign of the prophet Jonas. So he's trained them to look for signs. But he specifically tells them, I'm only giving you one. 
Why would he do that? Why would he do such a thing? Well, look with me at Matthew 12, verse 40. This is the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Question. Why did the Lord choose that particular sign? What's the reason? The timing of the sign matters. So the evil and adulterous generation asked for a sign. He gave them the sign. The sign was of the prophet Jonas. But what is the timing of that sign? It's after his death, isn't it? It's after his death, right? Just as Jonas was three days and three nights in the, heart of the, in the whale's belly, the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. So let me, let me tell you what I'm getting at. The Lord says, even though they've been trained to look for signs, I'm only giving you one. And by the way, that sign is after my death. Now, this is my opinion. You can decide for yourself. Look with me at Luke 23, verse 34. Luke chapter 23 and verse 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Verse 35, And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. In the Old Testament, is there a difference between manslaughter and murder? There is. Can a murderer be forgiven? The murderer has to be put to death. What can the manslaughterer do? He can flee to a city of refuge. So here's what I'm going to suggest you decide for yourself. There comes a point in the Lord's earthly ministry where he tells the 12, don't tell anyone that I'm the Christ. Right? Now, isn't John the Baptist baptizing water to manifest that he's the Christ? He is. Yet, if you look with me at Matthew 16... Verse 20, Matthew 16, verse 20. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Wasn't well, the gospel of the kingdom all about the fact that he's the Christ? Why is he telling them to not tell anyone he's the Christ? And here is the reason. Israel knew they were putting a man to, de to death. And that's not surprising because Israel stoned the prophets. But Israel did not know, they did not understand that they were killing the Son of God. That's why he said, Father, forgive them. And he wasn't lying when he said this, for they know not what they do. So what the Lord intentionally did at the end of his earthly ministry, is he says to the 12, don't tell anyone I'm the Christ. Now, after the resurrection, are they going to go preach that? Yeah, they are. But don't do it right now, because I don't want Israel to know I'm the Christ, because if this evil and adulterous, adulterous generation kills me, knowing I'm the Christ... I cannot pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let them not know. So therefore, don't tell anyone that I'm the Christ, and the only sign I'm going to give them is after they've already done what they need to do. 
after they've already killed me. Then they'll have the sign of the prophet Jonas. At that point, they should believe, and I will be able to forgive them because they did it ignorantly without knowing. Praise the Lord. Isn't that profound? God in his graciousness, in his wisdom, hides. He doesn't tell them right before the cross because he doesn't want them to be guilty of it. He's going to let them crucify the Lord in their ignorance of that fact because he wants to resurrect and save them. Isn't that glorious and gracious and just the depth of the wisdom of God? That is a convenient stopping point, so we will stop here uh, for the evening, and then we will pick up. Next week, we, we will be uh, out of town, but two weeks from now, we'll, we'll pick up with the questions and answers and hope that you'll join us then. Let, let me close this in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the scriptures. We thank you that you have preserved the word for us, that it's available to us, and we just, we give you thanks and glory for all that you have done. We rejoice in your grace. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.